This is Flipping Junkie Podcast, episode 11. Welcome to the Flipping Junkie Podcast. My name is Danny Johnson, former software developer turned house flipper, flipping hundreds of houses. Each week, we bring you interviews, strategies, stories, and motivation to help you get started flipping houses and on your way to becoming your own boss and achieving financial freedom. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now let's get to it. On today's episode, we've got Tucker Merrihew from the Real Deals Podcast. It's an excellent show, and you should all check it out. Tucker is a powerhouse when it comes to real estate investing. So he does a whole mix of different things from wholesaling, rehabbing, all the way to new construction. And that transition from rehabbing to building new construction, uh, building new houses, is something that a lot of investors uh, never really make it towards and uh, get to. And so this show is very interesting because we cover a lot of ground and cover a lot of new interesting topics. And also on the show, we got some awesome tips for what to do with direct mail that gets returned. So when you're sending postcards and letters, uh, you're going to get some of those back because the houses are vacant or uh, just being returned for different reasons. And I myself usually don't do anything with those. And most of the other investors that do direct mail don't either. So if you do the things that we talk about in this episode, uh, you're going to cut out a lot of that uh, competition. And, uh, you know, Tucker also talks about driving for dollars, and that's how he gets a lot of his best deals and we get into what skills people need that will set them apart from the people that don't make it in this business. So all around, it's an excellent show, and I hope you enjoy it. Howdy, Tucker. Hey, thanks for having me, Danny. I'm uh, happy to be a part of uh, your Flippin' Junkie podcast. Awesome. Thanks for being on the show. And, you know, so you're, yeah, and, you know, you, you do a lot of different things here. You do wholesaling, rehabbing, and, and home building. Uh, how did you get your start? What did you start with? You know, it, it kind of sounds a little overwhelming, you know, when you you know you say all those things that we're a part of, and we are, um, but you have to start. It didn't start that way. We grew into it. Um, you know, I started back in 2002, 2003 in the mortgage business, and that eventually, as a loan officer, that eventually turned into owning my own mortgage company, and then during the uh, kind of meltdown, as we say, of the uh, mortgage industry in the real estate market, that then birthed me kind of going full time into the investment side of the business. And um, so about 2008, 2009 is when I really, you know, kind of changed the heading of the ship. I closed down the mortgage company and put all my efforts into our uh, real estate redevelopment company and uh, really started doing large volume. I had bought in a number of houses along the way to that point, flipped a few, you know, lived in a few, renovated them, sold them, uh, made some money doing that. But 2008, 2009 is when I went full time uh, just in the real estate redevelopment company. And we started uh, mainly rehabbing because at the time, you know, late 2008, early 2009, it, especially in my market here at Portland, because it's not really a cash flow market. It's a, you know, it's an equity market. There weren't a whole lot of people buying anything. So uh, I remember the first deal I got under contract at the end of 2008 that was just a smoking deal. Uh, I couldn't wholesale it because I couldn't find anybody that would even buy a house at that point because wow. everybody was still so scared of the real estate market. So I actually ended up renovating it. We sold it, and I think we made like 55 grand or something like that, and it was a really you know pretty light renovation, um, all things considered. So that's kind of how uh, I started was actually on the on the renovation side, but it, not big renovations. I mean, they were pretty light, you know, ranch style homes, very simple homes, uh, mainly surfaces. Uh, a, a few you know major systems here and there but nothing like add-on or second stories or things like that at least when we started all right and you know so what are you mainly doing now in your, your real estate investing business so since that time you know we've grown a lot of different ways um, obviously the amount of people that work for me has grown um, and because of that we've gone in two directions we've also gotten into a lot of wholesaling uh, over the years now um, and we've also gotten into a lot of home building. And uh, most recently, you know, we're doing some development and then building as well. Um, so right now we're, you know, the way that our kind of flow works is we do a lot of direct to seller marketing. Big, big advocate of that. We really don't buy anything off the RMLS. We don't go to the auctions anymore. Um, used to do both, but, you know, times have changed. So what we do is we do a ton of marketing. It's a lot of very targeted marketing uh, to certain areas, certain types of properties. And so we get our lead flow coming in. We kind of cherry pick, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, the best ones out of there, or you know, out of our lead basket, so to speak. 
of what fits in our model for uh, knock down new build, new construction, maybe, you know, high margin renovations um, for, you know, least amount of work. And then everything else will wholesale out. So uh, wholesaling is just wholesaling is just kind of one arm. Renovating is another and then uh, development, new construction is another. So it sort of depends on the lead, you know, based on what the lead is and what would be best for that property is, is how you decide which way to go with it, right? Yeah, I- exactly, exactly. And now let's let's step back just a little bit, though, because you talked about we do a lot of di- uh, direct response, a lot of uh, marketing to motivated sellers for certain types of properties in certain areas. Can you Can you explain that a little bit more, like what types of marketing and then what are those types of areas uh, yeah, that so, you're targeting? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So... Um, for example, you know, when we do our knock down new build, um, aspect of my business, which is basically new construction, right? You knock down the old house, you build a new one in its place, or you knock down a house, you split the lot, you build two new ones in its place. Those are very targeted type properties. So we do a lot of driving for dollars and, and everybody knows what driving for dollars is, but, uh, we'll drive certain areas and we'll identify those properties that would be best suited for that type of, of model. And so we'll market to them. We also drive the same areas and we try and identify, you know, maybe ones that would be best suited for just a renovation. Um, so we do a lot of driving for dollars. That's how we generate most of the lists that we mail. Um, of course, we do sprinkle in a few other lists, you know, like uh, tax delinquent, code violations, things like that, some of your standards. But our best lists by far and away are our driving for dollars lists. Yeah, that's awesome. There, there's a lot of people that, that think that that's not a very good way to find them or it's very time consuming and very limited in the... But but honestly, that's you know so many people target sort of the low hanging fruit, so they go out and get the Epstein owner list, and end up mailing to people that are getting letters from fifty other people. Um, but let's let's talk about the driving for dollars a little bit more because you you said uh, you know you go and look for these areas, look uh, for properties that would be good for a, a knockdown and and build new. So what exactly what type of property when you're driving through these neighborhoods? Are these neighborhoods where they're you know pretty uh, expensive homes where People have renovated a lot of them, and you still have some small, dinky, rundown homes in between, like here and there that you try to target. Yeah, yeah, definitely the nicer areas. Um, you know, the reason being is because in our market, building permits are very expensive. So we, you know, it's it's hard to build new construction under let's call it three hundred, three hundred fifty thousand, and make very much money. It, you're really better suited just doing a renovation because of the amount of work that's needed um, for the money that's made. So generally, we target areas where um, the end product of what we're going to build is going to sell for you know five hundred thousand to two million plus. It just depends. We have we do kind of a wide spectrum, mainly weighted towards the higher end these days. But we'll go in and we'll identify these neighborhoods or these these established areas, and we'll go try and find the houses that maybe you know you've got two bedroom, one bath, eight hundred square foot house, right? Those smaller type homes that aren't suited for a family that um, you know the area has matured and grown around it it's become more of a a nicer higher end family type area uh, around it but that two bedroom one bath house doesn't really fit it's not the highest and best use for the land or the lot right can you walk us through maybe a a typical deal like that so you know the type of property like you just mentioned the two one uh, 800 and something square feet maybe the numbers of, of what you look for what you try to buy something like that for and then the cost of, of of building a home and what size of home that would be and what you can resell that for? You know, it's going to vary dramatically um, as far as, you know, what you, the numbers are going to be. But we'll just do an example of a house that we sold uh, last month. And sure. it's in an area here, uh, a suburb of, of uh, Portland called Lake Oswego. It's a nice area, um, you know, nicest public schools in the state which is why there's so much demand there. It's also, you know, it's a nice, it's a very, very nice suburb of Portland. High, um, you know, household income numbers, uh, great schools, great area. So we were buying in a neighborhood, uh, we were trying to find these two bedroom, one bath homes, uh, in a neighborhood within that Lake Oswego area that we were paying anywhere between 300 and 350,000 just for the two bedroom, one bath tear down house. And so we would basically buy the house for, let's call it 325, uh, we would then build a new home for approximately that same amount, and then we would sell the finished product for just around a million bucks. Wow, what size of home would that be? Uh, about 27, 2,800 square foot homes is what we were building in that neighborhood with no basements, which obviously is a big thing because that factors in pretty heavily to your construction costs. Okay, so so not having a, uh, adding a basement makes it 
more makes cost it effective to build a bigger yeah because if you if you're building new below grade square footage it's it's just fairly expensive it's, it's expensive to do because you got to dig it out you got more concrete more foundation more finish work um it, it's just a more expensive home to build generally in this neighborhood basements weren't needed uh, it's not a deterrent for buyers so it's one of the other reasons why we kind of identified this neighborhood we we only have to build 27 2800 square feet of above grade square square footage and we can sell the home for a million bucks so it made it a real um you know appealing area to do that type of strategy in Wow, that's awesome. So what's the time timeline on something like that, like buying the house, getting it tore down, and uh, having the, the new one up and sort of days on market to get that sold? Yeah, start to finish is going to be somewhere between five and six months. Um, you know, if, if you've got a system down and you've got plans that you've, you're already working from. Um, so if, if you've got, you know, it's not the first one and you've got a, something, a plans that you've used before that maybe you can tweak or recreate or whatever um, and you know what you're doing, five to six months is about the timeline um, as far as buying it, knocking it down, building it, and then selling it. You know, that obviously varies as of late, you know, uh, meaning the last 12 months. Um, you know, we've sold most of our stuff before ever putting it on the market, or if we do put it on the market, it's been on maybe a week. Wow. Yeah, and I saw the pictures on on your website of some of those homes that you've built, and absolutely beautiful, you know, fantastic work on on all those houses. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, we put a lot of effort into design. Um, you know, we've been recognized on a lot of different sites. We've been voted best on house like five or six times. Um, so we we definitely put a lot of emphasis into creating that that great product. And I think that's one thing that a lot of investors don't really do they don't put a lot of effort into that side of their business it's more about you know if it's cheap it's good and so we've kind of deviated from that outlook and you know we've gone up market we do a little higher end project but we also put a lot more effort into our design and and to this point it's really paid off for us yeah that's awesome so one thing that i've always been curious about with with having homes built is you know how are you finding the construction company the contractor to to build these houses for you so that's kind of another thing that we do differently. Um, I actually have my own construction contractor's license. So I hold the, the, the general license essentially for the business. And so we are our own general. Um, I've got uh, a project manager that works for me. Uh, my wife is a, uh, our designer and our construction schedule and our budgeter. She works for the company as well. Um, so we essentially hire ourselves to build the home. Wow. So how much do you think that you're saving? I know that's going to be, you know, all over the board, but... Um, you know, roughly you know, how much? I don't really equate it to what we're saving. Uh, it's more about what we're controlling. Um, because when you when you hire somebody else to do it, you know, money aside, you're giving up control and you're putting your, you know, your money, your well-being, you know, your risk in their hands. And I just, you know, for the type of product that we build, which is a higher-end product, there just aren't a lot of general contractors that have the they're not qualified, let's say, to take on that type of project and do it well. So, um, you know, I don't really look at it in terms of saving money, although we do obviously uh, save some money because we don't have contractor markups, you know, from our subs to our right. general to us. Uh, but we maintain 100% control of our projects. We manage them all the way through. Um, it just creates for a better product. And, uh, you know, ultimately it makes me feel more comfortable about taking the risk on building these nicer type homes. All right. So did you so did you have a background in, in construction, you know, to to be able to handle what you're handling? Or is that something you sort of learned with the rehabbing business? You know, I didn't really. Um, you know, my dad built a couple homes when we were younger, uh, the one that he lives in now and one for his folks. And I had to spend every Saturday on the job site with him and I absolutely despised it. So I never <laughs> thought that I'd want anything to do with job sites. And now I spend my weekends on job sites. But, um, you know, I didn't really, I, it really came from just starting out. We started with those kind of really simple ranch style homes. And then from there, you know, we graduated up to maybe doing some uh, gut rehabs, doing some additions and then into new construction. So it was just kind of a, a growth oh, process, yeah. the, the, the standard type growth process where you just get comfortable with a little more and a little more and a little more. And you really start to understand how homes are built and what are all the pieces and how they go together. And so it, it was just really kind of a slow growth process over the years. So do you do that often with the rehabs where you add uh, square footage to the homes? We did a bunch in the past. Now, personally, no. I, I, I would rather put a gun in my mouth and do them because they just are, <laughs> there's so much more work, uh, so much more management, and you know, new construction is just an easier way 
to make those bigger margins. I think that, um, you know, I know a lot of investors that haven't quite made that leap to new construction because they, they just feel like there's this great divide between renovating and new construction. But once they do, the ones that I know that have, uh, I mean, they don't, they never look back because there's just no reason to do big add on renovations. If you've done new construction, it's just so much simpler. You can put it on a conveyor belt. It requires much less management. There's much less retrofitting. There's much less question mark as far as what things are going to cost and what you can do. Um, so we've done it. I've made a lot of money doing it, but moving forward, you know, we just stick with new construction because it's just a better, smarter, easier way to make those big margins. Great. So with the wholesaling part of things, so, you know, which ones do you typically decide to to wholesale versus rehabbing and, and uh, tearing down? So, you know, it really depends a lot on, you know, our capital position. Um, you know, we've got a fair bit of capital that we work with, company capital that, uh, you know, I've accumulated over the years. And then we've got, you know, uh, I don't know, somewhere around four or five million dollars in private money that we've raised. And so, you know, my job at this point becomes, you know, I'm basically a money manager on top of, you know, a business owner. So I've got to make sure that money's deployed and working to the best of its ability. And so depending on whether or not we have a place to park a lot of that money, uh, is, that really determines whether or not we keep something or we wholesale it. So most of the time we wholesale those kind of bigger remodels now. Um, you know, that's something that, you know, we, we wholesale virtually every time we get one of those types of leads in. And it's not hard to do it because they're usually in nice areas. Uh, the margin that somebody can make is a very attractive margin. And there's a lot of guys that just haven't gotten into new construction yet, so they line up for those types of projects. Um, the other homes that we'll rent are wholesale as opposed to renovator are kind of, uh, you know, hood houses, houses in kind of not so nice areas, um, you know, that may ha may have a slimmer, you know, pr potential profit margin for the rehabber, but it's also a lower price point. It's an easier rehab, um, things like that. Those are usually pretty easy for us to wholesale as well. So those are the two types that we mainly wholesale a lot of. All right. And a lot of the markets around here, you know, there's so many investors now, you know, the competition's pretty high. And so it makes sense a lot of times to wholesale because you can find people sort of paying insane prices to pick up some of these investment properties. Uh, you know, what's the market like up there in Portland? I know you have a, like a, a new um, podcast that you're also doing about the, the market up there in Portland. So maybe you can talk about both of those things. Yeah, we just started a new podcast. It's called the Portland Real Estate Podcast. It's just all about Portland real estate and the Portland real estate market. Um, our market has been really, really hot for, you know, probably the last year, uh, on and off. But uh, most recently, we had like 1.7 months of inventory, which is insanely low. And basically, that means that you know, uh, retail buyers are having a really hard time finding houses, and and rehabbers are having even a harder time finding deals to rehab. Right. So. Uh, you know, wholesaling in a market like this right now is really, really easy uh, because, you know, like you mentioned, people are paying ridiculous prices just to have a project to work on. And so we, we've we sold into a lot of that demand um, over the last year on the wholesale end, and we've taken advantage of it. Uh, we just actually uh, flipped a, or wholesaled a teardown in a really hot part of Southeast Portland uh, just a couple weeks ago for, I think it was about 75 grand profit. Um, wow. We could have built it out. We could have made more money. But, you know, demand is so high right now. People are paying such a premium for, you know, not only renovation projects, but also teardowns in these hotter areas that we said, you know what, let's unload this out of our pipeline. Let's take our winnings at 75 grand. It's a great profit. And, uh, you know, let's just move on to the next. And so that's what we did. So, you know, it's, it's really easy to wholesale when the market's hot. But on the flip side, you got to work harder to find those deals that you can wholesale. Um, so it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Right. All right. Now, with the with the new construction versus rehabbing, I want to talk a little bit more about that because I think there's a lot of investors that have considered it. And I think maybe just, you know, with the, the rehabbing, there's a lot more education out there. There's a lot more uh, opportunities for people to be mentored in getting into flipping and rehabbing. But with the new construction, uh, you know, I don't know. I haven't really looked very hard, but I'm not sure that there's as much out there to do that. What are some of the key points that you feel make new construction a better option than rehabbing? Um, well, first off, you're right. There isn't a whole lot of um, education out there because there just aren't a whole lot of investors that have kind of made that leap or crossed that bridge from rehabbing to new construction. It's kind of almost two different worlds. You've got your, your world of rehabbers and you have your world of builders, and they really there isn't a whole lot of crossover. Um, as far as getting into home building, uh, you know, I think that um, you really have to be good at 
finding the inventory to build in the right place. I think that's huge. Um, obviously, then you've got to create plans. Um, you need to have an architect. Um, you know, so there's a few pieces that aren't at play when you're doing a rehab. Although if you're doing a big rehab, you should have an architect. Um, you know, then you have to get the plans engineered. Um, you have to have trusses designed. You know, you need to have a foundation contractor because you have to pour a new foundation. Um, you know, maybe some rehabbers haven't done foundation work or haven't done much of it. Uh, so you have a few things here that you don't have on your rehabs. Uh, but really, those are the only major differences. That and you've got to knock down the existing house and get rid of it. So you've got to find an excavation company that will do that for you. You've got to do a few of your preliminary things as far as, you know, maybe your asbestos abatement and things like that before you knock the house down so you don't get in trouble by the EPA. Um, but there's just a few little pieces that, that make the difference. Um, but a lot of those, you know, I guess those few little pieces collectively scare people off from making that jump. Right. And what I've, I've seen from, from people that have considered it and said, no, I, I don't want to mess with all of that because there's just too much involved. Whereas a rehab, you know, could be a lot simpler, but like you said, if you set up the systems to do it to where it's sort of, you know, you, you get it going, then it, it really becomes like a repeating process that you're doing. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can really scale it. It's a, it's like a conveyor belt, you know, um, you know, this sub, then that sub, then this sub, then that sub. When you're doing renovations, it's, it's sometimes it's just a messy mess, right? Of, of who does what, when, and all that. I mean, you can systematize it, but you know, you, there's always kinks, there's always curveballs, there's always things you run into that change your schedule. So it just, it becomes more difficult to manage and to get that project completed, um, you know, especially with the bigger renovations. Whereas with new construction, you know, you know how long your HVAC guy is going to need to be in there. You know how long it's going to take him to rewire the, or to wire the house. You know how long your plumber is going to be in there. You know how long it's going to take him to pour a foundation. Your framers should know approximately how long it's going to take him to frame the house. So you have all these things that are certainties. And you also then get good at knowing exactly how much it's going to cost you to build the house. Um, which is another certainty that sometimes you, a lot of times you don't have with renovating, right? There's, there's a lot of I don't knows until you're into the project. Um, so it, it just becomes a game of a lot more certainties. And for that reason, you know, I like it a lot. All right. And let me see, you know, we, we talk about a lot of the things that, um, that we do that work out really well in the business, but you know, what are some of the mistakes that you've made? Maybe just maybe give us one of the biggest mistakes that you've made that you could share with us and help us avoid with either rehabbing, wholesaling, or the new construction. Yeah, you know, I'll talk about just business in general. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, the real estate investing business can be kind of a, a lone wolf business, right? You can It can be a little lonely at times um, just because that's the nature of it. And so because of that, people will sometimes, um, you know, want to get involved in partnerships, right? So they don't feel like they're so alone. Um, when they take on a project and I think sometimes people do that way too quickly and you know I know a lot of people that have entered into partnerships uh, way more that have entered into partnerships than those that haven't that have ended very very badly and so that will then you know either buck them off kick you know eventually uh, you know cause them to leave the business or it'll just really take the wind out of their sails and so you really need to be careful you know I understand sometimes partnering is a great way to get into bigger projects or new construction or things like that but Really think about who you're partnering with, just like you think about who you're going to marry, right? I mean, I, I say partnerships are sinking ships unless you really vet that person and you really think it out well. And so, you know, the wrong partnership can really, you know, buck you off and, and you know, kind of kick you out of the business. Um, but, the you know, by choosing wisely, it'll help ensure your long-term success, help ensure you stick around. Uh, but also help ensure you make as much money possible. So there's a lot of partnerships out there where one will cannibalize the other. You just don't get along or people don't bring the right mix of skill sets together. And I understand why people do it. But, you know, my biggest thing, piece of advice to everybody out there in listener land is just really, if you're going to get in a partnership, really know who you're partnering with and understand the value that you are both are bringing and make sure that there is adequate value on both sides to make that partnership work. No, absolutely. I think nothing's worse than seeing when two people that – that need help with everything, get together and act like that's going to solve their problems. Then, then it's one asking the other one, what do you think? And the other one's saying, what do you think? You know, and nobody, like nobody brings enough to the table on each side to, to really like provide any benefit. It's just more of like a comfort thing. You know, I'll have somebody to back up exactly. me and buying this house and we're both making a mistake, but we feel okay with it because we're both making it together. <laughs> but uh, Right, right. Yeah. So it's okay. You know, because if I lose out, you lose out where, you know, it wasn't just me that was the dummy, but Right. Well, awesome. So, you know, what, 
I always like talking about best deals too. If you have a sort of best deal that you've done, and it might not necessarily be like the highest profit or something like that, maybe the most fun deal. And do you have anything like that that you could share with us? Yeah, we're, um, I mean, I'll just make it relevant to today. I mean, I've had a lot of great deals, um, but we're actually working on one right now that uh, we bought about oh, 14 months ago. Um, we got a hell of a deal on it when we bought it. It had a tenant in it, and I left the tenant in it for the last year. We actually just um, kind of got him to, to leave about mm, three or four weeks ago, and we started the renovation on it. We bought the house for 110000 We're probably going to put about 25000 into it, so we'll be in it, let's call it 135 and we should sell it for somewhere around three fifty to three seventy five. Um, so nice. it's going to be a great spread. It's really a light, light rehab. And, um, you know, fortunately we held it over the last 14 months as the market's gone bananas here. And that's of course widened our margin as well. But, you know, as far as right now, things we're working on as far as work put in and money that we're going to get out of it. it I mean, that, that's the best deal we've got on the plate right now by far. Well, that's a nice deal. So what, what did you guys keep the, the tenant in because you, you were busy with other projects and just wanted to sort of let yeah, that one sit? I, I, I actually bought it because it was such a great deal. I bought it. I was going to keep it as a long-term rental, um, and I, so I just bought it with my own cash. But, uh, you know, after he said he was going to leave, I started looking around at the market, and that pocket had just gotten so much better over the last 14 months. It was kind of in one of those areas that was um, just really getting – it was gentrifying. It was getting a lot better, um, you know, night and day better, especially over the last 14 months. And so when I started looking at what it was now worth – uh, it just didn't make any sense to continue to hold it as a, a rental and just take the cash flow. Um, you know, it only it was only renting for you know maybe twelve hundred a month, thirteen hundred a month. Oh, man. Um, so it just it was a no brainer to say you know what let's just uh, let's pull the cord on this one, let's take our earnings and let's you know move it into something else. Nice. So what are your current goals for for your business and what do you hope to do like over the next year? Do you have plans for for doing something else? Yeah, we've got. Um, you know, we're going to continue forward. We've got enough uh, projects in the pipeline that we bought at this point to keep us busy for the next 12 months as far as building. And uh, we're going to continue doing uh, a lot of higher-end new construction. Uh, we actually are, are buying a, a acre and a quarter right now in the nicest uh, area of all of Oregon. And we're going to build probably a 3.2 to $3.4 million spec home on that. Um, so we've got a lot of really cool projects coming up over the course of the next year. Uh, we're also uh, just about to launch uh, a software of our own. It's it's an app, and it's actually a Driving for Dollars app. So that'll be launched oh, cool. within about a week or two here. Totally revolutionized the way that you can create custom lists like that. So I'm really excited to get that out there and uh, not only use it in my own business, but allow other investors to be able to use it as well. Yeah, that's nice. So so what do you mind telling us what that how that's going to work? Yeah, basically. Um, uh, it's an app that you open on your phone and while you're doing your driving for dollars driving around you can either speak the address into the phone or it gives you an overhead view um, of where your car is driving around and you can just drop pins on your phone you know with your finger to identify oh, whatever nice. house it is that you want to um, create a list for and then after you create that list it automatically pulls all the owner information and mailing address for you it merges it and it gets it ready for you know any type of marketing that you want to do so it it eliminates all the heavy lifting on having to actually research who owns what and where they live yeah not to mention writing down yeah you know that's that's the one thing that <laughs> yeah you don't have always worries pads. about whenever exactly right, whenever, none of the yellow pads whenever. or scratch papers or back of receipts yeah. or things like that so it's a really, really cool app, and, and it, it, the idea is, is it gets rid of that barrier of entry of creating those custom lists that you know, a lot of investors just don't get around to because it takes time and effort. and So this, this gets rid of a lot of that for really uh, hardly any cost. So it, it should be a really cool thing, so I'm excited to get that launched here in the next few weeks. Yeah, so that might be out actually by the time this is uh, this this episode is made live. So you guys ought to check. Is there a name for it? Where's where yeah? It's uh, drivingfordollarsapp.com. Um, if you go into the iTunes Store, it's uh, Driving for Dollars app. Uh, we'll have a free trial version in the iTunes Store, and then you can actually purchase it uh, on the website. Um, but uh, I'll I'll have a link for you by the time this goes out, so that people can check it out if they want to. But uh, it, it's it's going to be really cool. We've been working on it for about two years, and it's been my maiden voyage into the software world which uh you know you're a little more experienced in that than i am but uh it's it's been a real uh, learning experience but you know at the end of the day the finished product is going to be amazing yeah yeah i know exactly what you're talking about every like you know it seems like a thousand people have an idea and and they want to do it with the software and you know after being through it you kind of realize like why so many people haven't executed it you know like <laughs> having the idea is easy but then actually getting it done is Wow, it's, it's it gets to be pretty difficult. You are a hundred percent right about that. 
All right. So uh, let me see. I wanted to also, you know, the Driving for Dollars app, and you do Driving for Dollars for your marketing. You know, would you mind explaining a little bit more about your process of, um, you know, without using the app, like right now, what are you doing for, um, you know, when you get the address, what are you doing? So, you know, currently we write the addresses down and then we have, um, you know, somebody research them to figure out who owns the property and where they live. And then we start putting them into our, our direct mail sequence. And we do a lot of handwritten stuff. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into total detail of exactly what it is that we send, but we've got a lot of specialty pieces that we've designed that, um, you know, we feel are worth the extra cost above what, you know, most investors will spend on their postcard or standard yellow letter uh, to try and solicit a response because the list is so targeted. Um, so we'll put them in a, you know, a four, five, six letter sequence um, that we just keep mailing and mailing and mailing. Um, you know, the thing about the driving for dollars list is it's a timing list, right? Not everybody wants to sell when you mail them. So, we just keep mailing them and eventually we get, you know, calls off of it that just continually come in as that timing lines up from us mailing them and then wanting to sell. Right. Yeah. So you're hitting them over time for when they are. And I've had it happen where somebody's contacted me after, I think, four or five years from a letter. So when you do that kind of marketing, you know, even if you stop, you could still be getting deals, you know, three or four, five oh, years yeah. later. Yeah. I mean, we the house that I told you about that we're going to do that 3.2 to 3.4 million dollar spec home. The people that called me with that lot, I mean, it's super highly desirable lot. We mailed that three and a half years ago, and wow. they kept my letter and kept it in a file, and now the, the father whose property it was is um, having some serious health problems, and they need the money from this to pay for his you know care and all that. Uh, but they kept yeah. the letter, they put it in a file, and they called me three and a half years later, and here we are buying the property. Awesome. That is, that's cool. I love hearing about that. And um, you know, you had talked about the, you have people research who owns it. You know how they're finding out who owns the property? Yeah. I mean, there's a, a million, uh, sites, but you know, you can go to your, t uh, tax site or whatever, um, locally. And, uh, we've got our, a title company site that we use to kind of access that stuff. Um, you know, some people have, uh, easier time getting those resources than others, but that's another reason why we created the app because you don't have to necessarily have an in with the title company to be able to look all that stuff up or, you know, if it's in a, a county that you know, maybe you don't have the tax site or they don't, don't make it easy to find that stuff, um, we're able to do it all for you. So, of course, the data, the big data providers can do it, but, you know, some people don't have accounts or, you know, don't um, have the ability to, to pay for the, the large minimums that they require every month to have an account with them. Yeah, and not to mention having to actually go in there and do all the searching. Plus that, yes, but, exactly. Yeah. So, so what happens, I, I know whenever I do a lot of mailings like that, I get a lot of letters back or, and postcards back. You know, what, what are some of the things that you do with those, or do you do anything with them? Uh, we do a lot with them. Um, obviously, if, if they're not getting them, that means they're not getting other investors' uh, letters or, or postcards or whatever either, right? So um, when those come back, we sift them, we sort them. Uh, we have TLO as the search engine that we use to kind of track people down. And so we'll, uh, we'll track them down, and then we'll just basically uh, send the, the marketing out again to wherever it is that we think we can connect with them. And what website was that? You said TLO? TLO, yeah, is uh, the site that we use a lot to, um, you know, uh, basically research and find out where people are, um, you know, where they're hiding. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point because, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how many years I went with having stacks and stacks of these return letters and always saying eventually I'll get to finding where those people are. And, you know, I just get to the point where I'm sick of looking and I feel bad for not doing it. So I end up throwing them away. And I think a lot of investors are like that. So when you spend the time to go make the extra effort, it's well worth worth your uh, energy in doing that. Um, now, with competition the way it is, you know, do you have any pointers on beating your competition and getting a, a deal? You know, like, uh, for example, say following up with with leads where a lot of people maybe make an offer and just sort of forget about it after that. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not rocket science, but it's it's also not easy. Um, and I, I think that, uh, and we've created an entire product around this that we call negotiating with sellers. It's just being good at a talking on the phone. You got to have your phone skills; they got to be good. Um, but B is being likable and being able to negotiate in a way that keeps you likable. Um, you know, a lot of people, for whatever reason, in the real estate investor space, don't have very good people skills. 
And I think it's just because they haven't had, uh, maybe a lot of them haven't been in sales positions before, so they haven't had to refine their sales skills and their people skills. And so if you've got good sales skills, you've got good phone skills, and you've got good people skills, that's what's going to set you apart from your competition. And ultimately, I think that's the difference between people that make it in this business and people that don't. Well, do you have a couple pointers, a couple examples of of what you mean exactly by having the better people skills? Um, Yeah, so for example, you know, let's say you get a seller on the phone, right? And you want to buy their property and they say, well, give me an offer. Well, a lot of investors will take that as, okay, well, I guess I'll just email you over an offer and hope to hear from (laughs) you, right? And so that's one way that investor aid deals with it. What do you think happens to investor aid? Do you think they buy the property? Do you think they ever talk to them again? Probably not. Yeah, no. Um, Because they're shooting blind. They're giving them an offer on something they have no idea what the hell the seller even wants for it. So, you know, investor B is good at sales skills, understands that you need to at least get a uh, some sort of a ballpark figure from them, right? Or what what it is they want for the property. And so, investor B has gotten good at at taking them through a, a conversation that gets them to you know relinquish that information to you uh, because a lot of people will give you pushback on that and so knowing how to get that out of them for just one small example that continues you down the road of putting a deal together um, as opposed to the door slamming shut and you emailing them an offer and never hearing from them again right so that's sort of like talking to them and saying so tell me more about the property tell me more about the situation where they walk through and kind of start to feel what they were feeling for the reason for them contacting you in the first place and maybe relaxing a little bit and giving you more information, right? Right. I mean, relaxing is the big, the key there that you mentioned. I mean, you know, people want to do business with you because they know you, they like you, and they trust you, right? So the more you can get them to feel relaxed in the conversation, um, it doesn't feel so stiff and rigid, the more likely you're, to, you're going to get that information out of them. Right. So, so maybe you start out where they might have this idea that you're sort of going to be a used car salesman. And I, I've, I've right. had actually people tell me, like, you know, they just had the idea, the opinion that, that, you know, house flippers, they didn't know any, but they thought that maybe the ones that were just because maybe what they see on TV, you know, are sort of, you know, these slimy. We're you know, low-balling vultures, right? <laughs> right, right. So, you know, that's the opinion that a lot of people sort of have. And before, you know, when we probably both started in this business, you know, not as many people knew about flipping houses and you didn't have that stigma. But now I think maybe you do. And so as soon as like, so you start out with maybe they might have that opinion of you. So if you can convince them otherwise, well, by just being yourself and talking to them like a normal person, you know, they'll realize that. Um, and it, yeah, it's like you said, it's not rocket science. People always, you know, fret about what they're going to talk about or what they're going to say and how they're supposed to handle situations when, when really you sort of develop your own, you know, style and just being yourself and, and learning how to listen to what the sellers telling you and, and talking and walking them through their situation and why they were calling you in the first place. But. Exactly. And just getting comfortable in your own skin and comfortable talking to people about buying their property. I mean, you don't, most people aren't great at it on call one, two, three, four, five, right? I mean, you're going to oh, yeah. say stupid things. You're not going to frame the conversation properly. You're not going to probably get all the information that you need to, but you kind of develop your style and you develop a, a certain level of comfort with yourself. And over time, you know, the idea is you continually get better and better at that. And, and once you get comfortable with yourself, you know, people feel that. They know that. And when they do, then generally your chances of, get, of putting a deal together, let's say, not getting a deal, but putting a deal together increases. Yeah, and a lot of people might hear that and say, yeah, that just seems sort of like common sense. But, but really think about it because it's – and I, I believe in that 100% that, um, you, know, it, you know, as I've tried to hire some people to go out and make offers for me and, and try to get deals on the contract and – you know, the rate of, of signups, you know, or the purchases kind of goes down and you wonder why, you know, and a lot of it has to do if, if that person has never had one close, you know, they've never been able to put one under contract. Um, th- there's something lacking there. There's a little, you know, like they haven't had the experience of talking with enough sellers to where, now uh, you're right, that, that certain level of confidence isn't there. And I mean, you think about what you're doing, you're, you're talking about buying somebody's house and you're talking about paying cash for it most of the time. And so if that person doesn't believe what you're saying, it's going to be an uphill battle. Right. I mean, you got to remember that we're in the business of convincing people to trade equity for ease of transaction. That's it. That's all they're doing. And so, right. you know, if, if you just think about that, you know, it'll help you frame how you approach people. And they know they're most of the time 
99% of the time people we buy from know they're leaving money on the table, but they're trading equity for ease of transaction. That's it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I absolutely believe that. Yeah, a lot of people that haven't, you know, bought from motivated sellers before think that you're just going in there and taking advantage of somebody that doesn't know any better, but, but and you're I, right, no, everybody, I, they, they all know better, you know, these yeah. people aren't stupid. And you I, know. you know, I hate it when, I actually hate the word motivated seller, because it's like, what the hell is a motivated seller, right? I mean, yeah, you've got your typical motivation points, but I, I just say, we just need a reasonable seller, not a motivated, but mm-hmm. just a reasonable seller, because we're not in the business of necessarily, I mean, it happens every once in a while, you buy a retail ready house for 60 cents on the dollar, right? But r- most of the time we buy houses that are not best suited for the retail market. And so all we need is a reasonable seller who recognizes what the product is and that it's a wholesale type product. And as long as they're reasonable, then we put a deal together. Right. And most of the time, you know, it's situations where people didn't earn the equity. Right. And so it's, it's really not difficult for them to say, you know what, is, if I can have a check in my hand and next week and be able to do this thing that I want to do that I really, really want to do, uh, you know, then it's, it, it's worth it for them. Right. You've you know? got, you know, what I think they call that the unearned equity phenomenon, right? They, they haven't been in the house earning it for years and years and years. Um, so they're not as attached to it. But, you know, we bought homes from people that have been in the houses for years and years and mm-hmm. years. And they're still, you know, I think more so a lot of times willing to trade equity for ease of transaction, especially if the home needs work. Yeah. And I've actually been there myself with the rental properties that I've just dumped you know, just because I was like, you know what, I don't even want to think about that property ever again. <laughs> I could probably take some time and make a little bit more, but I don't give a damn. Like, have that thing closed in two days and it's yours, you know? Yeah, exactly. So you can understand, you know, people do get to that point and they know that they, they're leaving some money on the table. But they, again, it's easy transaction. Get it out of my life. You know, I don't want to deal with it. Here you go. It's your problem, child. Right. So do you have a book that you've read recently that uh, you think the Flipping Junkie audience out there would would be interested in? Yeah, I mean, I think that the the best book that I've read that really kind of um, helps me understand how to deal with people, because this is really a people business. Real estate's just the product, but really it's a people business, is, is how to win friends and influence people. I think that that's a, a book that everybody should read if they're going to be in this business and really understand it. Um, another book is actually one that uh, we've written here in my office. We put it on Amazon, and it's more of an entertainment book, but it really gives you the real-life glimpse into what it's like to buy houses directly from sellers and not through auctions or RMLS or agents or things like that. And it's called The Dirty Truth. It's on Amazon. It's, uh, I think we have, it's like 99 cents. We had to charge something. They wouldn't let us give it away for free on there. Um, but uh, it's eight of the craziest stories that we've ever come across in actually trying to buy houses directly from sellers. So that's kind of a, a, a real, uh, real life glimpse into what this business really looks like, um, you know, some days on the, on this side of it. So uh, I would say those are two great, great resources for people to uh, take advantage of. Yeah, that book sounds interesting. I'm going to have to check out that, that Dirty Truth book. I, yeah, haven't, send, uh, I haven't seen it. Send me your address and I'll, I'll send you a hard copy. <laughs> cool, cool. All right, well, you know, we, uh, we create the show notes uh, for this episode on Flipping Junkie, and you can find that at flippingjunkie.com slash podcast slash Tucker Marahue. And Tucker Marahue is T U C K E R M. E R R I H E W. So just go to flippingjunkie.com slash podcast slash Tucker Merrihue and we'll have uh, the key points and notes for the show as well as links to things that we've talked about, resources we talked about in this episode. You know, I really enjoyed it, uh, having you on the show, Tucker. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always, uh, you know, always a pleasure. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, your listeners got a lot out of this. I think we covered a lot of ground. I think we talked about a lot of really good stuff. Oh, we did. Yeah. No, I think uh, I I got some stuff out of this. So, well, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. And uh, until next time. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. That was an excellent show. Thanks for listening. And be sure to subscribe and rate and review the Flipping Junkie podcast on iTunes. It really helps out a lot. And I really appreciate it. And be sure to join me next week on the Flipping Junkie podcast because I've got a friend of mine from San Antonio, Mitch Steven, and he's going to talk all about owner financing. So see you then.